Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, OSA Engineering webinar session. Today's topic is about antenna and design in ANSYS HFSS. Uh, today's agenda, I'll briefly go through um, the, uh, the HFSS capability on antenna and the workflow uh, on the slides, and I'll show show the audience a, uh, a little bit hands-on examples on the <clears throat> how to do the post-processing uh, once you have an antenna simulated and also introduce get you guys a a very convenient tool that's called ANSYS Antenna Design Toolkit. So we can let's get started. Uh, so today we're focusing on this one product, it's called ANSYS HFSS. Um, it's a high frequency simulation tool. Uh, there's a lot of applica applications that can be can be simulated in this tool, including um, biomedical, um, high frequency antennas, uh, transmission lines, and also very electric, very large, electrically large. Um, in radars and lidars. There are uh, there are three major solvers in this tool. Uh, first is finite element. Second one is the integral in equations, and the third one being physical optics. Um, so each solver has its strength um, and uh the today we'll be we'll be using the uh, finite element method it's a efficiently it can efficiently handle complex material and the geometries and it's a volume based mesh and field solver and fields are explicitly solved throughout the entire volume and uh, it um it deals with Frequency and the transient solutions at the same um, at the same time. A little bit more on the final element method. Uh, it's a high frequency structure simulator. Uh, and it's a, it's also a full wave three D electromagnetic field solver. Uh, it's also one of the industry leading EM simulation tool. Um, uh, some strengths are its simulation. It's some strength on the finite element method would be a simulation driven product development. Uh, it can also shorten design cycle and it has a very high fidelity on first pass design success. Um, and another strength in the ANSYS product is with its adaptive mesh refinement. It provides an automatic, accurate, and efficient solution when it comes to the mesh. Uh, different from uh, the mechanical and the fluid products, um, uh, most electromagnetic products in ANSYS uh, uses this adaptive meshing. So that the users don't have to um, do the mashing manually. Um, now we can now we take a look at the integral equation solver. Uh, the technology behind it and uh, the technology behind it it's a 3D method of moment integral equation technique where the equation is on the right side of the slide. It uses Equivalence principle to solve only on surfaces. Um, so the uh, it one typical uh, application for this solver would be uh, radar or lidar on uh, say airplane or helicopters, where um, uh, the the uh, performance on the intent on those radars would be uh, affected by the metal metal shielding of those electrically large vehicles. 
So it could also it could also um, deal with antenna placement, uh, radar cross section, and uh, S parameters. And the advantage of this solver would be um, its automate its automated results with accuracy, effective utilization of automated adaptive meshing techniques from HFSS, which is the same for 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 the other solvers as well. Um, it employs adaptive cross approximation technique for larger simulation. It's uh, um, so in general, this solver is intended to solve uh, large electrical problems. Some other highlights in the HFSS product. There is, um, you can do a parametric modeling, parametric sweep, and also optimizations, uh, sensitivity and statistical analysis, as well as integration with uh, ANSYS Design Explorer. So now we're looking at a, 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 a typical overview of a solution process in HFSS. We start with a design, and that's where that's where, when we're looking at the initial project setup. We start at the design, and then we specify the solution type for the problem. Then we enter the model setup, where we either create the geometry or import the geometry. Set the uh, set the materials and the boundaries and excitations. Then we enter the solution setup where we do the analysis, it's either a frequency sweep or maybe a transient, then we analyze it. And if and uh, the, the, the software will uh, use the adaptive meshing that we mentioned before to, re, uh, to evaluate the solution, evaluate the results, and then refine itself um, to update the solution. Until it converge, until it until it converge. So, um, so this whole process, so, so this refi this uh, refinement process, we call it automated solution process. So, as you can see on on the on the top, we started with the geometry, then we have an initial mesh, then the mesh refines itself until we get a converged mesh. As we can see, this is the patched antenna, and on we can see um, the right, the right, uh, the meshing on the right picture. The the quality around the antenna is getting denser and higher. And at the, and one and the graph below the, below that picture is the convergence plot. Um, we can see that the con the con um so the mass uh, the max magnetic delta s is getting smaller and smaller with the number of passes uh which means uh the solution isn't changed significantly as it goes towards the eighth or the ninth pass that can that at that point it tells us okay the solution the results is uh converged and it should be satisfying One example, it's the same example as from the previous slides. Uh, so on adaptive meshing, it, it, as we said before, it provides an accurate, automated and efficient solution. It removes requirement for manual meshing expertise. Um, uh, a little bit about the meshing algorithm. The, it, it, it adaptively refi refines the mesh throughout the geometry uh, and it also, iteratively adds mesh elements in areas where a finer mesh is needed to accurately represent the field of behavior. Um, that would be, so in this geometry, that would be the area around the antenna itself, as we see here in the previous slide. So now we can take a look at, we can 
um, take a look at the software itself. So we start with um, uh, elect this electronic desktop where it's like a it's kind of like a platform for the entire ANSYS electromagnetic product. Um, so we open one up, we open the desktop. desktop. Um, before we open any projects, we always want to uh, um, make sure uh, set up some so, uh, set up some um, uh, 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 requirements or option uh, set up some settings in 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 the tool in the tool options so that um, for example there is boundary assignment we want to use withers for data input when creating new boundaries we want to duplicate boundaries or mesh operations with geometry and also in the 3d model settings we want to have want to, want to add it properties of new primitives in the rendering we sometimes we can set uh, the default transparency to 0 0.7 so that the uh, um, the interior or the internal components of your geometry would, wouldn't be completely shielded out by the by the case, and we also want to uh, we may want to select last common command on object or sub model. So th those are all optional, but that's usually the standard uh, setup before we open up a project. So now we enter the initial project setup. We we um, decide this. We, we insert a new project, new HFSS design in the project. Um, um, just excuse me one second, I'm trying to find a pen somewhere so that I can maybe I can draw options. Never mind. <laughs> so after we, we insert a HFSS project, then we decide the solution type. Uh, in this in this example we are selecting the model. We could also have selected uh, driven terminal for this problem to get the same results. Uh, it really depends on your problem. So uh, we're looking at a um, Now we have a, a metal wire, metal wire uh, antenna. Um, so usually, to to per, to perfectly conducting cylinders with a total length. Uh, so the metal wire is to perfectly conducting cylinders with a total length of approximately half of the lambda, which is half of the uh, wavelength. And we also want to set up a air box around the geometry. Um, um, so that the air volume surround the antenna element to allow the radiation of fields radiating boundary condition will be applied to outer surface to act as infinite free space. So if without without a air box being uh, presented, um, HF physicists would uh, defaultly recognize uh, the free space as uh, radiate as 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 conducting as conducting uh, conducting volume. So we always want to have a air box, uh, which is a boundary uh, set up for your uh, for your problem. And lastly, you want to set up an excitation. In this in this case, we are using a lump port excitation. Uh, it's applied to a rectangular drawn. Uh, between each arm of the dipole to provide an RF excitation to antenna element. So it's, uh, I believe it's somewhere on a cross section or on the tip of this metal wire, in the middle metal wire. Uh, at this point, 
everything is being set up, we can use this um, 3D component library, which is also a um, NSYS uh, unique capability um, to uh, add a dipole antenna. So the antenna contains parameters for antenna dimensions. Uh, these could be changed before the 3D component is inserted or after it's been inserted. Um, so now we have the uh, dipole antenna inserted. All the um, parameters are, are already being set. We can always change it. And then we we'll take a we can take a model review. We're looking at the project manager and also the component tree. Um, so um, the three D component is uh, is consist of uh, it seems to consist of two arms and one port. And the excitations is also being is also the uh, included information from the three D component. Now we op we create an open region, uh, which is the air box we mentioned earlier, and we want this open region to be radiation operating at one gigahertz. Uh, and after the uh, the boundary condition is being set, we cl we can click on the boundary conditions on the left left hand side of your Window in the project manager, uh, and then you'll be able to see visualize uh, the boundary conditions. Uh, one thing to note is that all boundary conditions defined in the model can be accessed under the designs boundaries branch in the project manager. Left clicking on a given boundary will highlight it in the 3D modeler and provide access to its properties in the properties window. Double left click on a boundary will open a window containing the boundaries properties. So you can always change it if you don't want to have a, if you think the radiation boundary isn't the best fit, you can always change it to say FBB or uh, per, uh, PML. And the next step would be um, just hit the analyze button. Um, um, before, um, so that's, um, so the way how we do it is we add a solution setup in the analysis. Um, uh, specify the solution frequency, which indicates the frequency used for adaptive meshing process. Also, we specify maximum delta S, which controls the accuracy of the process by indicating the allowable S parameter variation between consecutive meshes. It determines when the meshing process has converged. So the, the, the smaller the maximum delta S is, the more uh, accurate, if you will, uh, the solution will give you. And then lastly, we also want to set up uh, to, to set the maximum number of passes, which indicates the maximum I times through the adaptive meshing process before proceeding to the frequency sweep analysis. Um, HFSS will proceed to the frequency sweep after this many passes, regardless for of meeting the delta S convergence criteria. So in this case, we're setting the solution at one gigahertz with uh, six uh, max max of six passes with max delta s zero is point zero two. And in the in the option, there is there is multiple tabs in the solution setup window. Uh, in the option tab, uh, just here we select the order of basis function as first order. So with the, those those are all being set up, we can click OK and proceed to set up a frequency sweep. So here we, the frequency sweep is uh, the type of the sweep we indicated as interpolating. The frequency setup type will be linear setup. It starts at 0 0.8 gigahertz, stop at 1.2 gigahertz with a step size of 0 0.01 gigahertz. So there will be about 40 steps in, in this frequency step. So now everything is all set. We can hit analyze. We, we, we can save the project and then validate the setup. If everything 
give us you a check, we can proceed to analyze. After that, we can look at the solution data to determine whether it's um, converged or not and how we do post-process it. So now, me now let me switch the window to the actual uh, uh, actual project so we can uh, kind of understand how to uh, post-process our solution. So right here, I have a uh, a dual polarized probe fat patch antenna. The setups are are mainly identical to uh, the slides that I just went through. So uh, here we just want to um, we just want to let everybody um, get a feel of how do we process post process after we get a solution in HFSS. Uh, so everything is being said. I already have already run the simulation. So uh, another thing didn't mention in the uh, lecture in the slides is that um, it's it's sometimes it's very important. I've encountered uh, this issue many times with my customers that I want to illustrate here. So there is in in the two coins. So in the um, on the menu tab at HFSS, there is design settings. There is this tab called set material overwrite. Sometimes we, we, we do want to check this enable material overwrite. That will uh, eliminate the need to sub subtract the, um, well, it adds additional, it's the, the purpose of this setup is to add additional rules to help the 3D modeler editor uh, resolves partial overlaps. So if the overlap exists between a good conductor and a dial, di, uh, dielectric, dielectric, the good conductor task takes per, uh, precedence. Overlaps between solids of the same material are reduced to warning messages instead of giving you a error message. So uh, by selecting this, we can eliminate the need to subtract the vias from the substrate. Uh, that the software automatically performs the subtract subtraction because the metal vs override the dielectric subtract in the region of overlap. Of course, in this in our example, we're not dealing with a PCB, so we are not looking at a vias or a substrate. But uh, oftentimes, even you're not dealing with PCBs, uh, your geometries might have some um, uh, 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 overlapping. So uh, this would be a very helpful option for you to look at. So as we said before, uh, this project, uh, this little problem has already been uh, analyzed. We're, so um, we want to look at whether the solution is converging. There's a couple ways to do so. Uh, first, we can look at the solution data. And there is a profile uh, before we look at the convergence, we can go through this. There's a profile gives you some uh, information on your simulation, including a number of passes. Uh, it says adaptive passes that converge here. It's all, there is also a very uh, short notice here, and uh, the time elapsed. So if we want to look at the convergence, now we can. Now here we. I said the maximum number of passes is 20, but as a matter of fact, there's only six of them being run, which means after six passes, uh, uh, the, the solution is considered converged. And there's the table. So uh, I probably set the, the, the max delta S as 0 0.02. So once after the six pass, once it hits below 0 0.02, the solution, the solution is considered converged. We can also look at this by click on the plot. Um, so there is our a standard, and after six paths, um, the solution is converged. Another way to look at this is that we can uh, generate a plot here that's uh, that's S11 versus adaptive pass. Uh, so this plot indicates how sensitive the S parameters are to change, are, are to the changes in the mesh. Since the S parameters 
stop changing, it is safe to say that the adaptive mesh, meshing process has converged. And how do we generate generate a plot like this? And the results, we right click on it, we select pre-model solution to data report, rectangular plot. Um, here we want, a, so for the solution, we want to select adaptive pass and the primary sweep will be pass and then it will be under as per, so the so so it will be a uh as parameter versus x plot which is exactly where we're looking what we are looking at right now to select multiple traces we just simply as using the word document shift it press shift and click all click the uh, the, the last item so the all all of them will be selected generate a new report then the report would be, would be created. So it's 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 identical to the one that I just showed. So after checking the convergence, we we might want to evaluate the S parameter data. Uh, the same same way as we as how we uh, generate the convergence plot, we generate a passive S parameter. Uh, just to give you guys an idea how to do it. Um, so instead of a adaptive pass, we just uh, select the a, a, a sweep as the solution. Uh, so it will be a S parameter versus frequency plot. We select all of them. Okay. And after after a plot is being generated, you can always delete it or modify it or rename it. We can rename this as passive as parameter plot one, so which it's the same. Okay, I'll delete this, which is because I already generated one. So uh, from this plot, we can look at we can see that at nine gigahertz, um, so. Uh, so the return loss at nine gigahertz is at about so the return loss at nine gigahertz is about uh negative thirty two dB uh which tells us that um the antenna will radiate virtually. Oh, uh, 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 it implies the antenna radiates best at nine gigahertz. So because it's a it's uh, uh the, the 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 rate the radiating and the receiving antennas are can be uh can be swapped. So S one one and S two two are having the same identical plot, meaning both meaning that in nine gigahertz, um, it's at maximum performance. Um, we could also create a active S parameter. Um, so what what it does for, what it, so the difference between a active S parameter and a passive S parameter is that the active S parameter characterize the return loss seeing at each port uh, given the device's active excitation. As we know, uh, for this example, we have two excitations, which means there's two um, there's two ports. So this active S parameter, uh, so so when, when more than one port is sim simultaneously excited. The signal pro propagating out of any port consists of the superposition of its own passive self-reflection S11 and the coupled signals from the other ports. Uh, the excitation applied to every port is controlled through the HFSS field. Uh, so, so how do we control how do we um, control the excitation applied to every port? It's um, it's controlled through uh, HFSS fields and added source 
we could also uh, access this window by just simply click add this source here, uh, right click excitation under that we will see add its source so uh, for this solution right now we don't have any excitations applied to port 2 where it's so there is so that's zero watt there um, So it's effectively it's so it's effectively turned off. Um, so we can we don't we don't see a difference between active S11 between um, passive S11. And also because the second port is turned off, so the S21 plot is non-existent here. So now we can take a look, see. What what would happen? What the plot would change if we change the excitation? Let's say we change the magnitude on the second port to be one watt with a ninety degree sh phase shift. When we apply for it, we can see that the S one one has change has changed has has changed um, from the from the passive uh, pattern. So, so, so as long as both ports one and three are excited, both traces will be visible in the plot. They can also look different from each other depending on whether the superposition is constructive or destructive in nature at the port. Um, now we um, we can set this back to. can set this back to um, zero watt. So there would only be one trace. Okay. So lastly, I want to show how to evaluate the soap soap field. So sometimes we want to have want to look at a uh, 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 want to look at a counterplot of electric field around the antenna based on the uh, the solution we just saw. So how do we do that? Uh, first, we select the geometry. We can either select it in the in the editor window or we can select it from the tree on here. Here we want to select the antenna substrate. Then under HFSS field, we plot field, electric field, and we select magnetic electric field. I mean magnitude electric field. <clears throat> Done. So we can see the electric field around around the two ports on the substrate. So this will so so this so by creating this 3D field overlay contour of the electric field magnitude solved inside the substrate. This plot definition is placed. Uh, is, is placed either from here or we can do it directly from here or even directly from from the window here. So this field represents the electric field produced when port, port, uh, port one and two are excited based on added source dialog window. Just as with active S parameter, adjusting the source would change the field. So if we change the source, the field will change accordingly.
then based on this contour electric field contour pl contour plot Uh, we can also generate an animation from it. So from the uh, from the project manager, we right click on field over overlays. Under, under field overlays on E field, we click on magnetic E, select animate. So, um, by doing so. This animation can depict the field as the excitation phase prog progresses from zero degree to uh, 170 degree, and this phase should not be confused with the phase delay applied between ports one and two in the added source window. Those ports will still have the same relative phase difference between themselves. Instead, this phase advances both signals simultaneous, allowing you to view how the single frequency continuous waves propagate and are superimposed throughout the model. The speed of the animation is controlled through the an animation window. We can control the speed. And this, um, this animation can be exported as an AVI or a GIS file format. And on the field overlay plot, we're still looking, we just stopped the animation. And then on the field overlay plot, we have, we can always change uh, the skill, which is the legend. Uh, right now we're looking at the spectrum, spectrum uh, mode, it's a rainbow. We can, we can also select temperature. Uh, it just gives you a different, um, different taste of the legend. We can also can we can also have grayscale. They can also be uniform, and we can also change the color for the uniform. We can also change the color of the ramp, etc. And we can also change the scale. Right now it's auto auto. We can manually uh, uh, set the limits for max and min. We can specify the values. We can also show the field in the in dB. Um, so if we switch to log scale, places more contour lines in the higher end of the color key, allowing you to see more detail of the larger field values using the limit. So using the limit and max, uh, limit max and mean precision to checkbox set the minimum value on the color key to the, to be some order of the magnitude below the park va peak value uh, so this whole fun this whole uh, functionality allows the user to quickly see how many db below the peak a particular field is in this case we set the darkest blue color we can <clears throat> we can try to change it to uh We can change it to instead of linear, we can change it to log. And we can check this and set the number of digits to two. So by doing so, we can quickly see how many dB below the peak a particular particular field is.
so um, that would be all I have today. Um, that was very uh, simple and quick, just trying to give everybody a, a general idea of how we uh, use the tool and how we post process in this tool. Um, if you have any further questions, feel free to email or, or send here. You can, you, if you have questions right now, you can uh, type it here in chat or feel free to send a email to support at ozeninc.com. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer your questions. And uh, lastly, thanks everyone for attending this webinar. Wish you a happy and nice day. <clears throat>